you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go. The shrill iron lady sings it. That makes it official. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. As always, we bring you the most smartest people in the world. The CEO, the billionaires, the White House presidential advisors, the Pulitzer Prize winners, the people who write these amazing books with amazing stories that teach you everything you need to know in life. And we bring it to you for 16 years, over 2,000 episodes. And uh, you guys should just be the most smartest people in our audience in the world at this point. Or, you know, halfway there. <laughs> anyway, we have an amazing author on the show. He's the author of the newest book that just came out, May 14th, 2024. It's called The Profiteers, How Business Privatizes Profits and Socializes Costs. We have Christopher Marquis on the show with us today. And uh, he, in this new book, it's an expose of how society pays for corporations free lunch at the cost of environmental damage, low wages, systematic discrimination, and cheap Goods. So we'll be talking to him about his uh, insights there. He is the Sinyi, is that correctly, professor? You got it correct. That's great. There you go. The Sinyi professor of Chinese management at the University of Cambridge and author of the latest book. His research examines business sustainability and social entrepreneurship. And he's written two prior award winning books Better Business, How the B Corp Movement is Remaking Capitalism, and Mao and the Markets, the Communist Roots of Chinese enterprise. He's passionate about how academic research can help people around the world address some of the biggest crises of our day, including climate change, inequality, and racism. Welcome to the show, Christopher. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much, Chris. Really appreciate you having me on. Really appreciate you coming on. We really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'm, having one of, I'm having a Monday, I guess. Congratulations on the new book. Give us shit.com. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? Sure. It's my, my name, chrismarquis.com. That's an easy place. I'm also LinkedIn. If you Google me, also you can get my university website too. There you go. Give us a 30,000 overview. What's inside your new book? Sure. You know, as you described, the thing I really focus on is how a lot of the costs for companies, uh, they don't have to pay, basically. So things like, you know, pollution they put in the air, you know, we pay for that through health issues, people in the community, you know, things like climate change, but that's not priced. So companies don't pay. And I go through and I talk both about how that, that idea pervades a lot of different sort of sectors and areas but also, and the reason why I think it's important to sort of have a book to focus on this is that for, you know, 50 plus years, companies have been actually very actively both lobbying and having PR campaigns to actually convince us that they should not have responsibility for that. So part of it is, you know, trying to, you know, identify maybe who should be paying those costs. Ah, is, is an example of that, like, you know, employees at Walmart or low paying fast food, different joints and, you know, their, their, their employees are having to live off public dole and welfare because yes, against meat. is that an example in your book? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And how we're, yeah, you know, we're basically supporting those employees and basically right. supporting those businesses. Right? Yeah. I mean, people are on, you know, in many cases, food stamps, obviously, you know, no health care. And the public pays for that. The taxpayers in the United States pay for that in this case. And, you know, Walmart gets access to cheaper labor and higher profits. And makes billions funding Wall Street investors. Oh, right. it sounds, sounds like capitalism and Americanism to me. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is. So definitely. It, it is a, you know, this is something I, I don't think we can just sort of blame and shame, be it sort of Walmart or mm -hmm. whomever. But I think that, you know, part of what I you know, hope, hope to do through the book is by really explaining that it's not just about sort of Walmart, but it's actually about bigger systems mm -hmm. issues that if people understand that actually, you know, they're paying for a lot of basically corporate profits. And of course, you know, companies will say, oh, you know, we should have the free freedom to, you know, do whatever, you know, exercise business however we want. Mm -hmm. 
sure, but actually they're impinging on all of our freedom and we're paying for basically, you know, as a public, their investors to actually, you know, get, get, get more profits. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, billionaires, you know, they're globus. They, they work around the world and live around the world and they love countries where they can just do whatever the hell they want. And of I course, think that's yeah. what a lot of their battle is, from my understanding, with our, with lobbyists and the and the Supreme Court and trying to you know get business on their side. You know they've won several different ways to do that. You know now you can just buy a politician. You can buy a SCOTUS member. Evidently, you just need a free <laughs> RV and you got exactly. your own. You can get one. Yeah, or, 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 who knew? Who knew it was just an RV, man? Yeah. I, evidently, it has to be at least a Winnebago or something. I don't it's know. a nice RV, though. It's a, it's, it's actually a really nice RV. <laughs> it's actually I, I saw Clarence Thomas interviewed once, and and he corrected the person. It is actually not. A, there's some other category that this. It, it's like a converted bus, and so it's uh, it's uh, there's some other category actually, and I, I don't I can't remember what it is, but yeah. we, we're not experts. Yes, I think it's in the Constitution. Oh. If it's an RV, fuck democracy. I think that's <laughs> right. Amendment. 30. So give us a little bit of history on you. What, sure. What, uh, how did you grow up? What influence you become, you know, in, in academia and writing sure. books? Yeah. So I grew up, you know, I, I get this a lot now. I, the last two years I've been at Cambridge, in, which is, a, you know, in the UK. And frequently people are surprised that I'm not British. So I'm American. You know, I just moved to the UK two years ago. So British accent hasn't rubbed off on me yet. I grew up in Pittsburgh and spent most of my sort of working life in the Northeastern U.S. And, and I think, you know, I've mostly worked at business schools. However, I don't know if it was my upbringing or, you know, through my education, just became really interested in understanding how business could actually play a positive role in alleviating our societal and environmental issues. And, and I must say that really, you know, we highlighted this profiteering part, which is the title of the book. But a lot of the book is really trying to understand how businesses can be more responsible in trying to internalize those costs in ways that both don't end up charging the public, but also so many of the companies I've studied really find this as an amazing fountain for innovation. Mm. You know, if you're trying to actually, you know, create new ways of, of doing business, it, it actually drives a lot of innovation. Oh, so it, does that offset the cost to the public? Do you find in your example? I, you know, I mean, it's it's these are very complex things to ta tabulate pros and cons, but but I know certainly anecdotally, anecdotally, companies find, you know, if they're being very creative and innovative in their sustainability work, these are things that, in many cases, you know, may lead them to be more efficient. May lead to new products, c categories, et cetera. So, you know, this is something where, you know, human resources, I think, is a big deal too. Mm -hmm. So, if a company really stands for something, has values, you know, a lot of the the youth nowadays want to really work for companies that have a purpose. And, and so I, I do think it's something where actually being responsible and being sustainable, it's, it's a long term, it's a long term play. There you go. So, it's kind of a, we have to balance and weigh and and decide. You know, is the is the is the is the price worth the cost? I suppose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a famous line from Rush that was saying, you know, we we will pay the cost, but we'll pay the price or something like that. Uh, that oh, is that, I, I'm a, I was a Rush fan when I was growing up. I haven't yeah. listened, to, but I don't I don't I don't know that I don't know that one. It was off for all the bones, okay. but it, it it basically played in that premise of you know we'll we'll pay the price, but we, do we do we really evaluate the cost of of what what it actually costs us. And I think that's what you've done here. Sure. So did, what do you suggest in the book that we do with the information when we're analyzing whether companies are, you know, doing more good than evil or vice versa? Sure. So I think there's a couple things that can be done. I mean, in, in many ways, you know, yeah. So there's things individuals can do. I mean, I, I think knowing, you know, what, a, having a better way of evaluating what companies are doing the right things versus the wrong things, I think is useful, you know, as consumers, I think also knowing more generally areas where there might be, you know, abuses basically of the broader economic and societal system, I think, you know, it's helpful to help policymakers. I think you're seeing this now around carbon emissions and taxing and, and markets. I think that people are, you know, 
or realizing that, you know, this is something where, you know, business has been getting a free lunch, basically, you know, the, you know, the, the sky is basically a free air fill for admissions, creating lots of, lots of damage. Then that's something where companies are start you know, sort of policymakers are starting to get engaged. It's a pretty substantially around the world. Plastic is another thing I look at quite a bit in the book. And this is something where, you know, there's increasing action at the state level to try to actually limit that. People and entrepreneurs are working to create, to basically avoid and eliminate plastic because, you know, as you pro- probably know, you know, we've all been convinced that we should be recycling. And of course, you know, if, you know, we should be recycling, but recycling actually doesn't work, sadly enough. Pro- plastic recycling doesn't work. Yeah. You know, if you look at the, I don't even know how many billions or, or whatever of tons of plastic have been produced. You know, historically, less than 10% of that has actually been recycled. There's, you know, all kinds of problems with that process. So the company is actually convincing us that we should be recycling as an example I give where companies are really just trying to put the onus on us and actually not thinking consciously about ways that they should be, you know, redesigning their supply chain, redesigning their types of materials, et cetera. There you go. There was somebody we had on the show years ago, and they called that term, like with the bullshit behind the plastic and the recycling, they called it green something. Do you know the term I'm thinking of? There's green wa- greenwashing. Greenwashing. Um, That's it. Greenwashing. Actually, yeah. I mean, so I don't know if you're, your listeners and, and you're interested in some of these interesting terms that exist, but I, 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 there's a couple of them that I think... So greenwashing is a really useful one. You know, this is where companies are trying to put a green sheen on their activities, mm. you know, make them seem like they're greener than they actually are underlying it. And this is actually came about from the hotel industry. You know, we've, you've probably stayed in hotels. We've stayed in hotels and there's a card that says, you know, we care about the environment, you know, hang up your towel. Turns out a hotel executive wrote an article, I think it was the 1980s, Mm-hmm. When this start, when this was starting to catch on, he said, "You know, we don't care about the environment. We care about saving money. You know, we 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 don't we you know we we don't want to have the hire the people to be sort of collecting the collecting and washing the towels. Actually, washing them too much actually creates wear, and then we have to buy new ones. So this is just basically about us saving money. Wow, that that's one that's one term. I do cover that a bit in the book. Yeah." McDonald's has been accused of it, Coca-Cola. Yeah, um, a lot of greenwashing out there. What are some of the other terms that you want to familiarize us with? Yeah, so another one, another one is astroturfing. Uh-huh. I don't know if you've heard of astroturfing. So is that where you uh, this, this your is... knee when you're catching yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah. There's all kinds of football things like turf toe and, and all these things. I've yeah. never, I haven't heard, I haven't heard of those in this context. But astroturfing actually refers to when companies form grassroots sounding organizations to lobby the government because go- the government, <laughs> you know, you know, will, will take, you know, w- wants to hear from NGOs and citizens groups, but frequently actually there's companies behind those. And so, you know, AstroTurf is fake grass. So the idea being that sort of fake grassroots organizations are, are AstroTurf. That's, that's another one. Hmm. There you go. What are some others that you want to share? Sure. I, green hushing. You might. This has been in green the news. Green hushing. Recently. Green hushing. I'm, I'm learning everything today. Yeah. So this is another one where companies are wanting to, you know, sort of. Sort of they, they 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 might put a big target on their back if they talk about green things. So actually, they're less likely to target about. It. So they're they're hush they're hushing on the green thing. Oh, green they don't end. they don't brag about it in case anybody starts. They don't brag. Deets, yeah. Ex- the details, exactly. The deets is the exactly. Deets. I don't know. Yeah. If I could say that one. Uh, maybe uh, yeah, maybe, maybe twenty like, years ago. It sounds like there's a lot. <laughs> what? Hold on, wait. Anyway, you just aged me. The uh, I'm, I'm the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. So it, it sounds like there's a lot of game being games being played with this. I mean, I know Tesla. Exactly. Tesla. I mean, for a lot of years, wasn't their core revenue you know playing games with carbon credits? Oh, exactly. Yeah. So I I forget. It might have been the state of California. I forget. Yeah. So a huge amount of their revenue they they were able to was because because of producing electric cars there was some tax benefit where they were able to sell some of the carbon credits exactly yeah yeah and you're just like wait are you supposed to be a car company making cars and then shitty things that look like 
Cybertruck microwaves and <laughs> I just saw one of those for the first time on the road. It was it's, they're bigger than I thought they would be actually. Yeah. They're just as ugly as I thought they would be. I just saw yeah, they like are. an hour ago or something. Huh. And oh, where where are you located, a, Chris? America, Utah. Okay, and, got uh, it. They have a dealership here, and I always see it when I pass on the freeway, but this one drove right by me. Oh, got it. And I was like, wow, so that's that's what a that's what a what that's what a stainless steel industrial <laughs> garbage can looks like. Um, yeah. I've been pretty critical and giving a lot of shit because there's was like all these design issues and breakdown and totally. definitely avoid the I, warranty if you wash them in a car wash. <laughs> oh geez. I saw one that was painted actually. I painted painted a, a, a yeah. like a neon green. It was quite a yeah. quite the quite Some, the car. I saw one this morning that was painted like uh, General Lee from from the Oh uh, really? The Hazard. Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. yeah. They had the oven on the side. <laughs> but evidently one of the problems you have is if you wash it like in a I, I don't know if it rains it would do the same thing, but if you wash it in a car wash, the 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 structure underneath the frame will retain the water in pools but you know it's eventually going to start smelling really great and, and it'll eat you know into the car because the the water is staying in there it's not sure yeah, yeah, yeah. Going yeah. they showed how they take apart and, and showed how they one of the problems they finally got they finally got dealt with was it the thing had a a problem where the the there was a, a stainless steel slider or metal slider over the gas pedal and it just literally, you would just take and slide it down the gas pedal to attach okay. it. Problem was, if you pushed it, it would slide upward in some cases, and then it would jam up against the dashboard, ah. and it would stay <laughs> stay fully down, which oh, doesn't geez. work well in you know school crossings. Evidently, <laughs> they uh, had to recall that. But yeah, it's just been a. I just, I just every day, it's like a whole new. Interesting thing. So, what are some other th topics in your book that we want to tease out to people to pick it up? That maybe sure. So, let me say a couple things. You know, I mean, we've you know a, a, lo a lot of the inspiration for me in doing this, you know, was from actually talking to entrepreneurs mm -hmm. who were thinking very thoughtfully about how to actually be responsible. And so, I have a lot of you know, sort of case studies and examples of how companies can be more responsible in these realms. So, one example is a company, Grove Collaborative, which may sort of sells makes and sells, you know, home goods, health and beauty type products. They have, they, you know, have a pretty, pretty good website. They both do their own products and do products of sustainable companies like, you know, Seventh Generation, Ms. My Mrs. Myers, Dr. Bronner's, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so uh, actually when inspiration for this book really came to me when I was talking to the CEO there, a guy named Stu Landsberg. And what he said to me was, you know, as a business in this, you know, home goods space, our biggest challenge is plastic mm. and actually use the term externality. So this, the subtitle of my book, privatizing profit and socializing cost, it, you know, expresses this sort of dry economics term externality. And he says, you know, we're dedicated to actually eliminating these externalities. And, and why I think this is important is because so much of the responsible business topics today focus on stakeholders like stakeholder capitalism, stakeholder management, and a lot of times, I think that is actually just a, a more sophisticated style of greenwashing where companies are doing selective positive things for these you know, employee groups or communities. But actually, if you look at their core of their business, they're not really addressing that. So the thing that yeah. you know, Stu Landsberg you know, really identified to me, we need to be looking at the core of businesses. And so they set, they set on this journey that created innovation. So they reformulated a bunch of products. So... Shampoo, I, I know now, but I didn't know back when I was talking to hit them. Actually, shampoo doesn't need to be a liquid. Actually, you can have bar shampoos oh, really? that are, that, yeah, totally. It's it it seems strange, but it works. I've you know last two years I've used uh, bar bar shampoos, and really? I think we just sure. yeah, and it doesn't have to be packaged in plastic. So this is an example of sort of an innovation. Wow. You know, they also you know created like an internal carbon tax. So mm -hmm. they've redesigned their P and Ls and and badging around plastic. So this is one example of how a company is using, you know, sort of, it's, it's sort of creating this drive for innovation by being responsible for their- I guess bar so shampoos, they don't require, I'm seeing, I'm looking online at these, they don't yeah. require like the bottle, the plastic bottle. Exactly. Right? And you can just sell them. It looks like some people sell them on cardboard. In, in exactly. Cardboard. And it's obviously, 
I mean, it, it's it, for many, many reasons. It's actually a much more sustainable uh, alternative. Yeah, but, we, but we're sort of in the shower. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, and you would think that it wouldn't, you know, like if you've ever used soap, like in your hair. I mean, it doesn't really lather very much. But at least the mm -hmm. ones that I've used actually work as effectively as regular regular yeah. shampoo. I think most men do that already, don't we? Don't they just take the bar of soap? And right. <laughs> yeah. We're lazy. I'm, I'm sort of guilty of that many times. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I saw a diagram the other day of how men wash, and it's like we wash kind of the middle part, the underarms, and then maybe our hair, and then we just right. let everything else work its way down. Like anything below the kneecaps never gets washed. You just kind yeah. of figure the gravity and stuff takes care of it all that's what i do i haven't washed my feet yeah. in like five thousand years <laughs> which is probably like a green or black yeah. or, <laughs> one of those colors whichever is funnier people just go with it but no i'm i'm really looking at this now online there's a lot of these shampoo bars yeah totally yeah i'm gonna have to check them out i know i know that estrogenics is a big deal i i don't know if you looked into any of that but i know i a didn't lot of, a lot of soaps and stuff and detergents have estrogenics. In, sure. And it's attacking men's testosterone and actually giving women the beginning of their of their uh, of their menstruations earlier by year. Uh huh. So, yeah. It uh, it you know it doesn't surprise me actually. A lot of the yeah I mean the the level of sort of chemicals and you know hormone types of 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 uh, pro, you know in in our products is really pretty pretty tremendous. One of the things I do look at is actually sort of hormones and antibiotics in beef supply chains. Actually, oh. this is something that, you know, you know, and one of the reasons why I look at that is because that's something that now investors are actually putting a lot of attention on because of some of these spillover costs that occur. Mm -hmm. So you might've heard that there's all the potential issues around antibiotic resistance mm -hmm. so because there's so much am antibiotics in our world through the food we eat etc you know people are becoming much more resistant to antibiotics so that you know if you actually get like a serious cut or you know have a serious infection actually sometimes people it takes a lot people a lot, long, long, lot longer to heal mm -hmm. so this is an example of, of one of these spillover costs to society that i talk about in the book and why i think it's an important one is that that actually investors are realizing that you know, McDonald's, for instance, you know, buys a lot of meat that uses these processes. But actually, if you think about an investor, other companies in their portfolio, healthcare companies, you know, are, are actually bearing that bearing those sort of spillover costs. And so McDonald's, for instance, they, they've investors have started to give them a hard time mm -hmm. through shareholder votes and pressuring the board to stop using that using these sort of hormones, chemicals, antibiotics in their supply chain because of this, you know, problem. That's unfortunate because I usually when I order a Big Mac, I'll just rub it on whatever wound I have <laughs> on and it helps. I think part of it's a multi-use product. Yeah. It's part of the secret sauce. I think that's, uh, that helps there. It gives me a rash for a while. I'm not sure what that's about, but <laughs> uh, just that's rub funny. it on any wound folks. Don't do that. The lawyers are going to call me. Yeah, what about the uh, what about the things that McDonald's and companies are doing where they're doing the, uh, what do they call them? They're basically the industrial food, you know, these industrial foodscapes of, of pig farming. Yes, yeah, totally. Farming and I imagine there's some sort of, you know, environmental fallout of that. And there's huge environmental fallouts. And, and it's all, I mean, another issue is that, you know, these... I mean, I mean, it's you know, I've, I've driven past some some of these before. I mean, this is you, you might have. I mean, the smell is horrible. Yeah. You know, there's in the air. You know, the sort of feces spray gets gets in the air, and you know, it's and people that live in those areas have severe respiratory issues. Mm -hmm. So you know, these are things that actually then disproportionately affect sort of lower income. People, areas because if 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 those are the people that have much less political power, and you know if they if these were ever in any sort of wealthy area, you know they'd be put out of business in a second because you know they they obviously the wealthy folks would actually be able to you know affect change within the government pro probably to either have these outlawed or have them moved or whatever. So it's a real sort of race to the bottom in where many of these things get put. There you go. Yeah, not in my backyard. 
but uh, poor people have yeah, they, right exactly yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. it's an interesting thing you know so i mean it's it's something we need to look at like i think i quoted rush earlier and he'll peer we will pay the price but we won't yes consider the cost and uh, this is a really big aspect because you know there's right. so much that we do you know you look at what you know i grew up in the era before there was the apa with with uh, with okay. carter putting that in and you know, I got to tell you, tires washing up on shores and uh, yes. and rivers on fire. I mean, that was kind of fun, really, when you think about it. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, the, I imagine that was, those are some good examples of where, you know, the the costs of what government, you know, what uh, companies were getting right. away with was, wasn't that good for other people when it came to health and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, back in those days, it was a little more, a little more obvious, although... Yeah. You know, not always because, because you know, you, you might remember one example of astroturfing is, do you remember the, 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 the advertisement? It's sort of called the crying Indian ad advertisement oh, where, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I mean, th th this was put out by, you know, the packaging association, you know, it's, it's the. The name, the name of the organization is like Keep America Beautiful is the, is the name of the organization. Uh -huh. But actually, it's about, it, it, it's, it's by, you know, Dow Chemical and various packaging oh, companies. Wow. And, and so they, they want people to think that it's, that it's our responsibility to take care of trash, which certainly we all should. So, and then, yeah. but, but really, I mean, if we're thinking about it, our responsibility, we're going to put less attention on, you know, on, on these packaging companies. So that's a case in point of both astroturfing and then also this deflection of responsibility to people so the companies are not as, you know, as focused on it. There you go. People need to read your book. What's a, what's a quick tease out to what people can do better? Can they just vote better politicians that are regulate this stuff and not be in the pocket of these big companies? Certainly, I think, yeah, political change is important. But I think also, you know, think about the companies that you buy from. Mm. You know, there's, you know, we talked about Growth Collaborative and, you know, Patagonia is another example. There's a lot of companies that are actually responsible doing, you know, do, doing the right thing. And I mm. think those are the, those are the key, you know, that I'd say that's, that's the key thing is just be thoughtful in mm. your purchasing. And I mean, as someone who has a, a teenage daughter, I mean, I know that the allure of, of she and, and fast fashion is, is tough to get over, but I think also we need we need to be thinking about, you know, sort of this not overconsumption, buy quality things, don't buy cheap things. Yeah, there you go. You know, uh, I'm going to read your book when I I've got a dinner date for McDonald's later. I'll read your book when I'm over there. No, I'm just kidding. I'll read your book. I'm just not going to read it. McDonald's. The uh, you know, plus you can rip the pages off and uh, put them in the in the burger, and it'll probably taste better. And it's more fiber for you folks. See what we do? There we do health uh, here on the Chris Voss Show. We're making sure you get your fiber consumption, but read the damn book first before you start eating it. So, Christopher, it's been one flavor. On give us your final pitch out to people to pick up the book and where they can find you on the interwebs. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, chrismarquis.com. Please be in touch. You can get my email there. You can email me through University of Cambridge. You know, I'm passionate about this issue of companies doing better and love to connect to, to people who are also engaged in that. So, please always feel free to be in touch with me. Would love to talk to you. There you go. Consider the cost of all that stuff. It's just insane to me, you know, in the world you and I grew up in, you know, we had glass stuff for a lot of things and recycling. Sure. But exactly. it's just insane to me how. You know, watching people with bottled water, like I was, <laughs> I first started seeing bottled water, everyone like, you guys not have faucets? What the fuck? Is that? <laughs> I had the same thought. Yeah, exactly. It's just, and seeing people just walk out of Costco with crates of it, you're just like, wow, there you go. Yeah. Fun is fun. Order up the book, folks, wherever fine books are sold. The Profiteers, How Business Privatizes Profits and Socializes Costs that we all end up paying for usually. May 14th, 2024 is when it came out. And check out Christopher's other books as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for Christopher for being here. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time. There you go.